will um, confront you with uh, things that we see in daily practice in patients with both stroke and atrial fibrillation for which we do not have solutions at the present time and therefore you all can be very active with commentaries because no one can be wrong because no one knows what is right. Here is my consultancy slide, significantly shorter than those of uh, cardiologists, I must say, as a neurologist. And here is a complicated issue. This is a patient with atrial fibrillation who already suffered a mildly disabling ischemic stroke six months ago. He has been put at that time on a vitamin K antagonist, and he was remarkably stable with his INR readings. So now he is admitted to the emergency room with a right hemispheric stroke and an NIH stroke scale of nine. What does that mean? This is a scale that measures the severity of stroke, and this patient would have a facial droop. He would not be able to use his arm and hand at all, he is able to get his leg up against gravity, but he cannot stand or walk, and he has dysarthria, okay? So that would be an NIH of nine, a moderately severe stroke. The NIH goes from zero to 30, and you can imagine what 30 would look like. This patient is awake and cooperative. So five hours before the stroke, uh, five hours have passed since the stroke uh, started. His INR at two point, is 2.5 at admission. And now this is his CT scan. It is not what we all thought it would be, an ischemic stroke. This is a bleed, but it's a small one. Um, cardiologists, when they see vitamin K antagonist therapy associated bleeds usually see the disasters, the big ones, the sometimes deadly ones. Uh, there are also smaller bleeds into the brain. Sometimes they may expand over the next half hour or three hours. Sometimes they stay stable like this. So here we go. This is an acute stroke patient. He had already an ischemic stroke. Now he has a hemorrhagic stroke. His anticoagulation was in, in the range that we wanted him to be. And here is my question to you. How do we deal with this patient? Will, are we going to reverse the INR? Who would do that? Just, no, there's nothing wrong, you know? Who would not do it? Okay, so two-thirds, one-third, about, Minutes. and uh, about 80% did not vote. <laughs> and when he is over his acute phase, goes back to a five in the NIH stroke scale, is ambulatory again, goes into rehab, he still has AFib. And he still has a fib that caused one ischemic stroke. Would you reinstitute anticoagulation? Who would? Great. It looks like a majority. And who would not? These are the people who act according to the label of anticoagulants. Because in the label, in almost every country, it says, absolute contraindication against anticoagulation is an intracerebral bleed at any time, not in the last three or four weeks. Interesting, isn't it? So this is something that we see all the times. And here's my opinion. I would not even reverse the INR. And I should tell you that, of course, this is a real patient. We did a follow-up CT. A couple of hours later, it did not change at all. We did an MRI a day later, 
and it showed that this was not the typical bleed, but a bleed from a cavernoma, which is a small malformation in the brain. Um, we did not reverse it because we thought this is not going to bleed any further. We thought, we did not know that. If you would do it, you would do it like you usually do it with uh, PPSB and uh, concentra uh, factor concentrates. And then you would move over to a subtherapeutic, subcutaneous low molecular weight uh, heparin, which in a way also influences your, uh, your coagulation system. So it is a very, very tricky situation here. And when would you reinstitute anticoagulation? So the majority would, okay, I would too, despite the fact that it's not in the label. But when? How long would and should we wait? The panel, please. What is your opinion about that? I'd go for a week. Should we have the microphones on here? A week? I hear a week. Yeah. Good. Any other? Can I, can I justify that? Yes, please. Please, go ahead. Because the, the, the daily rate of ischemic stroke with AF is actually quite small, but the, the, the risk of re-bleeding, even though you have more knowledge of that than I, has to be quite high. So I would want to ensure that the bleeding has actually completely stopped. Um, so I would wait at least a week. Okay. Any other opinions about that? Let's ask Professor Goldhaber, what, yeah. what would be the US practice here? Well, if I can just back up a bit, uh, I think the first point about this real patient is that <coughs> this patient had a spontaneous bleed on warfarin with an INR of 2.5. And about 40% of head bleeds with warfarin occur within that therapeutic range of 2.0 to 3.0. As the medical co-director of a 3,500 patient anticoagulation service, uh, I see this as a situation where uh, we're doing everything right. Uh, the patient looks good on paper and then has what to you might sound like not such a big stroke, but to me, a cardiologist, uh, when I hear about a patient with uh, dysarthria and a facial droop sounds like a, a devastating personal event. And, and it makes me, it makes me uh, realize that uh, to a more fuller extent how dangerous warfarin is. And uh, it also makes me wonder uh, several things. You had said that this patient had a prior stroke uh, so this is really the second stroke, if I understand you correctly. And now I'm wondering, was this patient one of those in the 40% who never initially received anticoagulation, uh, despite clear uh, guideline evidence for anticoagulation? Because the best, the best uh, approach is prevention uh, yeah. to begin with. Well, uh, in fact, the first ischemic stroke was the cause for starting vitamin K antagonists, also before that he already had a shed's of two. So yes, he is one of those four, but at least one where the reaction was okay. And I can only underline uh, the importance of what we just heard. The INR is a poor predictor of what's going to happen. We have ischemic strokes with underdosing, under two, one third to 40 percent. 20 percent of the ischemic, or, or uh, another 40 percent of the ischemic strokes happen when they are in a therapeutic INR. And you can even see ischemic strokes in patients who are beyond three. That is not that frequent, but it happens. So you cannot even deduct from your INR reading whether the stroke symptom you have in front of you is ischemic or bleeding by nature. So the, the other... Werner, we have um, yeah. Professor Fitzmaurice who wants to come back yes, to you. Sure. I'd, I'd just like to come back on that because 
you're making it sound like keeping a patient within a therapeutic INR isn't actually that good. The reason no, that you've got 40% of patients having hemorrhagic strokes is because we actually keep them well controlled and you can't prevent everything. Yep. So no. it's still important that we keep patients well maintained on vitamin K antagonists with an INR between two and three, but unfortunately some of them will have hemorrhagic stroke. And they're the patients that you see. Now, I work in primary care, and the vast majority of patients don't have hemorrhagic strokes, and you're preventing thromboembolic stroke. So we must, 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 if we're putting patients on vitamin K, try and maintain them as much as we can within an INR of two and three. Well, of course. I mean, that, that's not a contradiction. I'm just saying with a normal INR, there is no 100% uh, 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 prevention of, of strokes. Uh, absolutely, it's not no, only nobody's, the, uh, and nobody's assuming that there would be. But yeah. you mustn't get away, you mustn't send the audience away with the message that keeping them between two and three isn't important. Uh, I didn't Professor try Goldhanger. to do that. Yeah. Well, I think I think uh, David, your point begs the question of now we have an array of novel oral anticoagulants which across the board have at least a 50% lower head bleed rate than warfarin. So uh, the, the question is not only prophylaxing with anticoagulation the AF patient, but choosing an anticoagulant <coughs> that absolutely minimizes the most devastating complication of anticoagulation, which is head bleed. So, so I think- I couldn't agree more. Okay, uh, Vern, yeah. I think we better go on. Yeah. Well, restarting after hemorrhage, and, and we all agree we want to do this, um, we will still look at are there indicators for a high risk of recurrent hemorrhage, or are there indicators that we can use to judge <coughs> that this patient is probably on a lower risk end? And the risk of recurrent ICH is to, likely to be greater in patients with lower ICH. Lower ICH means the bleed uh, is into the cortex of the hemisphere, not a deep ganglionic hemorrhage, but in the, um, in the uh, uh, cortex, which has a higher recurrency risk. And also the volume of the hemorrhage is very much predictive. If it's a small volume hemorrhage like the one that you just saw, the risk is lower than if a patient had a volume of 50, 60, or even 100 milliliters. Um, the same is true with the um, risk of recurrent stroke and systemic embolism. It's likely to be greater, and that's uh, well known with a high SHED score, and TEE evidence of left ventricular dysfunction, left atrial enlargement, or left atrial thrombus. On the other side, the risk of recurrent ICH is lower if hypertension is well controlled. That is essential and with initial small uh, hematomas. And some studies uh, uh, suggest that the optimal timing for the resumption of anticoagulation may be between 10 days and three weeks, uh, not 30 weeks, after an ICH. Others uh, recommend restarting anticoagulation two to four weeks in cases with high thromboembolic risk and lower risk of ICH. So there are some hints that we can use, but definitely no guideline evidence for us. And uh, I guess also it will be very hard to get um, the guideline uh, evidence. So in this case, I personally would switch to a new anticoagulant quite early um, because it was such a small uh, 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 bleed because the patient already had an ischemic stroke in the past and uh, despite the fact that the daily risk uh, of stroke is uh, usually not very high, it is always a little bit higher in the first days after a stroke that happened. Evidence for that? No evidence at all and I would not put it into writing at the present time. Werner, can I, uh, there's a question from the audience about the potential 
uh, use of left atrial appendage closer devices in patients such as this um, who have had uh, an, an intracranial hemorrhage event. What's your view about that and what's the evidence to support that strategy? That's an excellent question. Um, there is only evidence from cases. We just finalized a, a, a series of about 20 uh, patients with exactly this condition and it's submitted to be published in the journal Stroke. Um, Yes, this is one of the alternatives. However, um, to my knowledge and uh, to what I learned from my cardiology colleagues, this procedure needs double platelet inhibition for a period of time. And double platelet inhibition also carries uh, a risk for secondary or uh, additional intracranial hemorrhage, but nevertheless, uh, we are doing this in patients where we would judge the risk of recurrent uh, bleed with uh, continuous anticoagulation very high. Okay, then no further questions. Should we move on? Yes, question? Well, so we saying we should do these. Question card. In a moment. We'll just take Werner's question, second um, uh, patient and then we'll move to those questions. Okay, so the, the second case, uh, case is 75-year-old uh, female, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, admitted to a stroke unit within two hours after onset of a mild stroke, uh, NIH stroke scale of six, so she would still be able to walk, uh, but uh, also it's mild, she is very much uh, disabled by the fact that she is aphasic. So she cannot give you any, any good information about uh, what happened and uh, what kind of medicine she's on. Reportedly by a bystander, she was treated with a novel anticoagulant, but it's unclear which one. And again, the patient cannot tell you anything about it. And I can tell you this is currently evolving into daily routine, that we have patients treated with novel anticoagulants, getting a stroke, in this case an ischemic stroke with a normal CT scan, and a patient who seems to be the ideal candidate for thrombolytic therapy of acute ischemic stroke. But we have no idea what her co coagulation status is like. So which tests would you order to find out whether thrombolysis can be started or not? Sylvia? <laughs> well, first, we do everything you do normally. That means you take the conventional tests, and then you ask yourself, what do they tell us? And we know that this patient is on a new oral anticoagulant. In addition to APTT, perhaps we can also, if this is held on site, uh, do the hemoclot test to nail down the intake of a thrombin inhibitor. If this hemoclot test is not available, APTT and perhaps the thrombin time, if uh, available, is strong enough to give us good information in the direction of a thrombin inhibitor. The question is how can we prove or exclude both directions the intake of an anti-10A compound? Can we rely on the prothrombin time, which is part of the routine testing? And here it may become critical because we have sensitive and less sensitive new anti 10 A agents towards the prothrombin time measurement. Apixaban may not give you a signal, rivaroxaban may give you a signal, but this is again unspecific. The turnaround of a specific NT10A testing may be too long for the stroke unit. It may take, if available at all, at midnight or so, um, three hours. And then we, the question is, if we can rely on a normal prothrombin time and a normal <coughs> APTT uh, to say that is a safe c condition to do thrombolysis. Our neurology society is split around this question. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a clear answer. We have 
have got it in writing that if these conventional tests, APTT and prothrombin times, are normal, that uh, at least we don't see a contraindication to thrombolysis. But I think the jury is not yet out and uh, things may change over time. Yeah. Uh, th this is why I asked her, uh, because she knows much better than, than I do, and I'm always getting confused, and then I think of my residents uh, who are in the emergency room, how confused <coughs> they may be with, with all this information. Um, in the past, when we had vitamin K anticoagulation, we had a point-of-care test, INR, which gave us the information in a few minutes. And for, for years, uh, we have been promised by the industry that those point-of-care tests will be available for the specific <laughs> new drugs. And my point is we need them because uh, as long as the, the jury is not yet decided what to do, the risk of doing thrombolysis in someone who is still actively anticoagulated is very high. And uh, the, we learned over many years that the INR of 1.5 to 1.6, that is about the, 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 um, the point where we can start thrombolysis if we are lower than that. We do not really know at the <coughs> present time when should we dare to use thrombolysis. And in a case like this one that I uh, presented to you, even the new um, thrombectomy devices will not help because someone who has an NIH of six and by that not a very big stroke will not have a vessel lesion that is accessible to one of those devices. So a real problem and there is a question addressing this. Yeah, the fact that this patient suffered the ischemic or thromboembolic stroke on one of the novel anticoagulants indicated patients probably missed one of two of the doses. And we know that the new oral anticoagulants, all of them, they have very short half-life. So to my opinion, there wouldn't be high risk of bleeding because of that. Well, the, the, there is a... There is a number of, of uh, uncertainties uh, within this argumentation. Uh, we touched upon it earlier. Uh, we can get ischemic strokes in someone who is fully anticoagulated at the present time. So I would not say this is uh, the fact that this patient has an ischemic stroke tells me he is not anticoagulated. Uh, if that would be so easy, I mean, then, then we would not uh, have to discuss it, but it's not the fact. Okay, should we move on? Is there more for this case? No, no there's, I think we, we covered it all. Okay, then we've got just a minute left, so I want to deal with two further questions. Quickly, David Fitzmaurice has one from the audience. Okay, this question was about something that was on the slide around um, some debate about the Thank risk you, for patients between 65 and 74. So to, to put the, this is a cyclical question. When I started in this godforsaken anticoagulation world, everybody over 65 should be on anticoagulants. The world's changed, we've had chads too, we've now had chads first. <laughs> So at, at, the, at the moment, if you're aged between 65 and 74, you should have an additional risk factor beyond being female to uh, mean that you should be warranted an, an anticoagulation. But my personal opinion is everybody should be on anticoagulation unless you've got a jolly good case otherwise. Okay, that's very clear. Graham, you had one further question as well from the audience. Uh, what was the role of the new oral anticoagulants in patients with combined AF and ACS and there is no role at the moment, uh, as you know, the dose for stroke reduction and atrial fibrillation with the one drug that's been shown to be effective in acute coronary syndromes is 20 milligrams once a day, but for ACS is two and a half milligrams twice a day. Uh, so we don't know what the risk of bleeding will be if you add antiplatelet drugs to 20 milligrams. We know it will be high, uh, and th hence the reason for the study pioneer so at the present time, there is no role for the novel anticoagulant drugs, 
and we should stick with the guidelines which utilize warfarin in conjunction with antiplatelet therapy. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to close this symposium now very quickly by telling you what you can expect to see over the next few days from the Garfield Registry in the main Congress. And tomorrow, a very interesting uh, paper to be presented by Professor Verhoyt uh, as an oral presentation at uh, 4.45 in the afternoon. And it's on the one-year outcomes in atrial fibrillation patients with and without uh, acute coronary syndrome. So that, uh, I think, will provide further insights into the question that Professor Turpey has just been answering. This is rather small, but as you exit the uh, auditorium, you'll be able to pick up a leaflet that gives you the location of all the other uh, Garfield presentations with new data from the registry to be available at this year's ESC. Uh, we also have a stand in the exhibition where you can get further information if you wish to on what's been published so far and what's happening uh, in the registry. Uh, it's uh, stand A343 and you can meet the team there. I'd just like to thank our faculty for having uh, presented so well this afternoon and the thoughtfulness of their uh, interactions. For you, the audience, for having come and join us here this afternoon. To uh, Bayer, who have provided an unrestricted uh, grant for us to continue this uh, programme of research uh, through to uh, five cohorts. And we very much look forward to seeing you all again next year for a further update from the Garfield Registry. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.